Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, www.compassionatecooks.com. Hi, everybody. First of all, uh, I've received some compliments from people about the podcast theme music, and I realize I feel terrible. I never acknowledged the musicians all this time, and I think we're coming up to about a year doing these podcasts, which is really exciting. Uh, My husband and his band actually created the music, and if you have our cooking DVD, you'll recognize that theme. It's the music in the opening and closing credits. So they were going to create a new theme for the podcast, but I really liked that tempo and I thought it worked really well here. So I used it. So thank you to my husband and to his bandmates. They're still working on a name, so I can't just give you a name, but uh, they're working on several. I don't like the newest one, so I'm not even going to give you that name. Anyway, that's who did the music, and thank you for those who who sent me kind words about it. At the risk of sounding redundant, I have to thank you again for your beautiful letters. I feel so honored to do this work and to be the recipient of your gratitude. I have so much hope because of you, and I thank you all for that. I've updated the document on the website that includes excerpts from your emails and your letters and reviews that you've left on iTunes, and you can go view it if you go to support our podcast and then click on read what listeners are saying. If you ever feel the slightest bit doubtful in people's ability to change or feel hopeless about the future, I encourage you to check out people's very humble and inspiring stories of transformation. I'm just, I'm just blown away. I'm also very grateful to the podcast sponsors. I want to thank Colin Lovis. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Colin, for his very sincere sponsorship. We corresponded a few months back, and he wrote that he, quote, sincerely hopes that I will continue producing these podcasts. He said that, um, quote, they're done with thoughtfulness and are very inspirational. Thank you, Colin. I do plan on continuing this podcast, and it is because of sponsors like you that enable me to do this. This is what they call listener-supported broadcasting, so thank you very much. I mentioned in a recent episode that our most popular level is the $10 a month level, and unbeknownst to me, the link wasn't working when I actually made that announcement, probably for a couple weeks. So thank you to a new sponsor who alerted me to the error, which is now fixed. So if you'd like to set up a monthly sponsorship, you can do so. Just visit CompassionateCooks.com and click on Support Our Podcast. As a thank you, you'll receive a recipe packet every three months for the $10 a month level, which consists of five or six recipes in that packet, and you can pick the theme. You can see the various themes under recipes on the website. So thank you again, Colin, and thank you to all the current and future sponsors. You really are making it possible for me to produce this podcast, and I'm recording today's podcast on my birthday. I want to f- memorialize this birthday, so so I thought I would record today's podcast on this day. As you probably know already, I'm a contributing writer to Satya Magazine and a columnist for Veg News Magazine. But I'm also very interested in getting my essays and my articles and my letters out to the general public, and I've had several letters printed in various newspapers around the country. I'm a contributor to a program on KQED radio called Perspectives. KQED is my local NPR station, and I've had articles published on Common Dreams and Alternet and some other places that are considered progressive websites, progressive news media websites. And every time I've had my views printed or read on the air in the case of Perspectives, in the case of KQED, I've received feedback from people, right, primarily in the form of emails, but also via the message boards on which people can post their thoughts about a particular article. And some feedback is very positive, some is very negative, and some falls in between, and I've pretty much developed a system that helps me determine when to reply and when not to reply. I absolutely don't reply to vitriolic messages. I don't have time for that. And I don't reply to absurd messages or questions. But I do reply to those people who sincerely want to engage in a dialogue about this issue. I've said this before, that this issue, this big issue being really our perception and treatment of animals in our society is a dialogue that I think is really lacking in our culture and in the media. Since we're bombarded with sensationalist headlines about veganism and animal rights, black and white presentations of the issue, and sound bites that ultimately entertain more than they actually inform or educate people. 
anyone who has ever taken action on behalf of animals, whether it's through an article or a letter published in a magazine or a newspaper or through a demonstration or a protest or through leafleting or simply by living your truth, by not participating in the exploitation of animals, you eventually learn that when you speak your truth, criticism will most likely follow. Sometimes it's anger. Sometimes it's hostility. Sometimes it's just a really uninformed question. I used to do what I call street TV, where I would take to the streets with a television set and a generator and play Meet Your Me, which is a video of undercover footage from animal factories, stockyards, auctions, slaughterhouses. And I would set up on a busy corner in downtown Berkeley and, you know, you just wait for the crowds to form. They always form around the television set because, well, first of all, there's someone standing there with a TV, so people are pretty drawn to that, but then they also see what the images are. And the experience was always incredibly powerful. It's definitely a lesson in human behavior, a true in the field anthropological and psychological experiment. And contrary to what you may think, it was always a positive experience. Groups of people would crowd around the television set. Some would cry. Some would be in shock. Everyone would simultaneously wince at the same scenes. Uh, Some people would walk by and thank me, saying that they were already vegetarian and they appreciate what I was doing. Everyone who watched it, you know, however they were affected, would walk away thanking me. Uh, Many wanted more information. They began asking questions about nutrition, food, etc. Really an amazing, powerful experience, and I wish I had more time for it these days. I was always fascinated by the fact that there were always more males than females willing to watch. Um, I always took note of people who stood watching from afar. Some people would just kind of drop back and watch from from far away, not wanting you to know that they were interested, but interested nonetheless. And they were often women, which again, I think is really interesting. And some of them were the girlfriends of the men who stood and watched up close. And I felt really honored to be part of that moment for people. This was the first time many of them had seen this footage. And like most of us, they had no idea. And I always left with a feeling of hope after after witnessing people's reactions. Now, of course, there were other things going on as well. Sometimes people with mental health issues who clearly weren't taking their medication would start preaching or hollering right where everyone was standing and you know, it could be annoying and loud. Uh, sometimes people who were drugged up or liquored up would pass by and say something stupid like, oh, I can't wait to have a burger, you know, I mean, whatever. And they would just keep walking. You just ignore those folks. And then you'd get the other typical, albeit also unoriginal responses that many animal advocates have heard for years. And this is what I want to talk about today. The one I can always count on receiving each time I publish an article or each time I hit the streets with Meet Your Mate, you've all heard it before. It goes something like, why aren't you helping people instead of wasting your time on animals? You've heard it, right? Something like this, you know, why aren't you helping children? Why do you hate people? Why do you hate humans? Whatever, something like that. And the cute thing about this is that it's always posed as a question, but nobody ever sticks around for the answer. Nobody ever sticks around to actually have a conversation. And this applies even when it's not in person. When people post something like this on the internet, on message boards, on their own blogs, they're not really engaging anyone in a dialogue. Like I said, some people have written similar things to me, but in such a hostile way that I'm not going to respond to them. And I find it really interesting because it's cowardly to write something like that in an angry way and you don't have a face, right? I mean, when you write something on the internet like that, it's anonymous. You don't put a human being on, you know, you just don't put a face on the other side of that message. You don't think another human being is actually reading it, which again, I think is really interesting that they're accusing animal advocates of being hostile towards humans when their attitude is usually very hostile. So that's that's just something I find really interesting about this dynamic that goes on. They just make this statement because they also think they're catching animal activists in some sort of trap, some sort of trap that's supposed to ultimately prove that animal activists care more about non-human animals than their quote-unquote fellow humans. And though this might be true for some, I don't know, you know, 
I do think it's interesting that this could very well be the worst thing you could accuse someone of, you know, preferring non-humans to humans. And on one hand, look, humans have made a pretty bad name for themselves. I talk about this a little bit in the episode I did about the Heifer Project. I'm always struck by this, and I find it really ironic that though I'm heartsick every day listening to the news about how we steal from each other, and we lie to each other, and we cheat each other, and we rape each other and we brutalize each other and kill one another, I've never heard any of these people called anti-human. I've never heard anybody say, why, why, don't, why don't you care about humans? Why don't you, you know, if someone was accused of stealing millions of dollars from stockholders or something, no one says, well, you know, what is it? Why don't, why don't you care about humans? You know, nobody c- calls them to task and actually asks them that. We as a species have a great capacity for kindness and compassion and sensitivity and empathy. And we as a species have a great capacity for cruelty, for violence, for brutality and vengeance, some of which we take pleasure in. So let's just keep this all in perspective. We live in a society that objectifies animals and makes them seem like the brutal ones, despite what we do to each other and to other animals. The greatest irony of all is that when we hear about the worst human atrocities, we call the perpetrators of the crime animals. We're not saints, and they're not savages. So let's just keep that in perspective. One of the ways this accusation is phrased, I mentioned uh, before, is why don't you go help children instead of helping animals? Why don't you care about children? And I have to say that I feel really sorry for people who think that we aren't capable of caring about more than one thing at a time. I find it really sad that some people think so little of their fellow human beings that they assume we're limited in our ability to care about everyone. My heart is large enough to hold everyone, and I'm really sorry that some people limit their compassion. I've found that the more compassion I actually give to the world, the more I have to go around and the more that I get back. What good could we possibly be doing for ourselves or anyone else if we parceled out our compassion in a piecemeal fashion, if we created boundaries around it, right? I mean, where would those boundaries end? At different races? At different genders? At different species? Should we ration our compassion? I mean, it sounds really silly, but it seems to me to be the implication when people judge animal activists for being compassionate. You know, related to this, I believe any work, any work that focuses on creating nonviolence and kindness in this world affects everybody, affects all other types of social justice. They're all connected. Animal activism, animal advocacy, animal protectionism does not exist in a vacuum. Compassionate people all have the same goal, the elimination of oppression, exploitation, and violence. Abuse, violence, and cruelty all spring from the same source, and they all have the same effect. More abuse, more violence, more cruelty. The link between cruelty to animals and violence towards people has been well established. It's a cycle well rooted in the homes of slaughterhouse workers, where the prevalence of domestic abuse and alcoholism is astounding. Milan Kundera, the author of the book, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, has a beautiful quote that's actually in that book. It says, Humanity's true moral test, its fundamental test, consists of its attitude toward those who are at his mercy, animals. And in this respect, humankind has suffered a fundamental debacle, a debacle so fundamental that all others stem from it. That's what I believe. The problem is not the people who are doing something in this world. The problem is not the animal activists who are actually showing up and doing something on behalf of those who are suffering. There are a lot of problems in this world. There's a lot of work to be done. And there are a lot of people who sit on their duffs doing absolutely nothing. There are fewer who actually get up, speak out, and do something to make this world a better place for everyone. To criticize animal protectionists for not doing enough, for not spending their energy over here as opposed to over here, is ridiculous. Instead of criticizing animal advocates for their misguided compassion or whatever it is they're accusing them of, why don't they instead ask the people who aren't doing anything why they aren't acting on behalf of children, right? I mean, let's 
make people accountable for the work that has to be done in this world. But let's not focus on the people who actually are active already. And of course, I'm always tempted to ask my accuser exactly what it is they're doing on behalf of a better world and why they're wasting their time criticizing me and my fellow advocates instead of making better use of their time helping all those children they seem to care so much about. And I don't mean to sound sarcastic, but I mean, really, there are better ways to spend your time than writing a letter accusing me of of hating children. I mean, it's just, it's not founded. It's just not true. And it's just, it's so caustic. The dichotomy that some people create between animal rights and human rights is so unnecessary. It's just unfounded, especially when you look at all of the early founders of the animal rights movement, both in the UK and in the US. All of these early founders recognize that this issue is connected with every other issue. In England, you may hear of William Wilberforce these days. A film was made about him. He was a member of parliament and the first member to introduce a bill to abolish the slave trade. He introduced this bill every year for 15 years. He worked tirelessly on behalf of abolition, of vociferous abolitionists. He opposed slavery on ethical grounds, and he was also a voice for animals. In 1800, he supported bills to abolish bull baiting and bear baiting, a sport that was pretty common in those days. In 1821, he sponsored a bill to, quote, prevent the cruel and improper treatment of cattle. And in 1824, he helped found the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, which is the predecessor of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. He was active in educational reform, prison reform, the promotion of public health initiatives, and advocating shorter working hours and improved conditions on factories. I just can't see how his work on behalf of animals hindered all his other humanitarian work. Clearly, it didn't. In the U.S., there are countless examples of humanitarians who included animals in their circle of compassion. And before I say more about this, I highly, highly, highly recommend a book called For the Prevention of Cruelty, The History and Legacy of Animal Rights Activism in the United States. I think it's one of the most important books written in a very long time. It's by Diane Beers, and it's amazing. You can actually purchase it through my store. If you go to CompassionateCooks.com and click on Stock Your Pantry, it will bring you to my Amazon store that I've built so I can recommend books to you and cookbooks and cookware, etc. And I have the main page is called Featured Favorites. And you can see that book right there. And you can purchase it that way, or at least to see what it looks like. I interviewed her for Saatchi magazine. I can't say enough good things about this book. In it, you'll read all about the early founders of the animal protection movement in the United States and how they all, without exception, had been involved in other social justice causes, such as the abolition of slavery and women's rights, particularly voting rights for women's suffrage Carolyn Earl White is the uh, founder. She's a just an absolute hero of mine. She's the founder of the American Anti-Vivisection Society, and she was a tireless advocate for animals. And Henry Berg, who is credited for founding the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, is also responsible for the protection of children in the United States. It's a fascinating story, and it's recounted in a book called Out of the Darkness, the story of Mary Ellen Wilson. Mary Ellen Wilson was a little girl. She was born in 1864, who was terribly, terribly, terribly abused, terribly neglected by her legal guardians. At that time, when Mary Ellen was about 10 years old, when the, by the time someone was trying to intervene around 1874, laws against child abuse didn't exist. There were some murky laws about excessive discipline, but when Etta Wheeler appealed, Etta Wheeler, who was intervening on behalf of Mary Ellen, when she appealed to the New York City authorities about Mary Ellen's abuse, they were reluctant to intervene. They didn't intervene. And she, after failed attempts to help this little girl, many failed attempts and much deliberation, it was recommended that she go see Henry Burke. He was the founder of the ASPCA because of his connections and because of his concern for the voiceless and for the powerless and for the oppressed, all connected. Because of Henry Burke and his involvement and the connections that he was able to put Wheeler, at a Wheeler, in touch with, Mary Ellen was removed from the abusive home and her guardian was actually convicted. 
In response to what he saw as a real need, Henry Berg established the first organized child protection institution in the world, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, in 1875, and he continued to fight for children and animals until he died. These are just a few examples. You know, there's so many, but it's just so important, I think, to see how closely linked all these issues are. The founders of the animal protection movement in the U.S. were hardly misanthropes, and I think it's a really unfair accusation. In fact, I do feel compelled to say that I think it's interesting that though every animal activist I know, they're conscious on many levels. They show up at peace rallies. They're, they show up at environmental protests. They, they shop locally. They buy organic. They buy sweatshop-free products. They really just try to make sure that they're addressing all of the issues of the oppressed. And I just wish I saw as many progressives, people who consider themselves progressives, show equal consideration to animal issues. I don't see them showing up at film screenings or protests or demonstrations or what have you. I just wish there was more of a connection on their end, environmentalists especially. Not only do I believe that our treatment of animals is connected with all these other issues, I believe it forms the foundation of everything else, including our treatment of others. And that's a larger discussion for another time. But I'd like to end today's podcast with an incredibly powerful essay by J.M. Coetzee. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2003. And this is an edited version of a speech he recently gave at the opening of an art exhibit in Australia called Voiceless, I Feel, Therefore I Am. He's just such an eloquent writer and thinker, and I wanted to share this essay with you, and I thought, since I'm talking about this topic today, this was a perfect time to share this with you. So I'm just going to read this right now. By the way, just a note, if you're not familiar with the word abattoir, it just means slaughterhouse. He uses that word a couple times. I want to make sure you know what it means. So here goes. J.M. Coetzee. To any thinking person, it must be obvious that there is something terribly wrong with relations between human beings and the animals they rely on for food. It must also be obvious that in the past 100 or 150 years, whatever is wrong has become wrong on a huge scale, as traditional animal husbandry has been turned into an industry using industrial methods of production. There are many other ways in which our relationship with animals is wrong, to name two, the fur trade and experimentation on animals in laboratories. But the food industry, which turns living animals into what it euphemistically calls animal products and byproducts, dwarfs all others in the number of individual animal lives it affects. The vast majority of the public has an equivocal attitude to the industrial use of animals. They make use of the products of that industry, but are nevertheless a little sickened, a little queasy, when they think of what happens on factory farms and abattoirs. Therefore, they arrange their lives in such a way that they need be reminded of farms and abattoirs as little as possible, and they do their best to ensure their children are kept in the dark too, because children have tender hearts and are easily moved. The transformation of animals into production units dates back to the late 19th century, and since that time we have already had one warning on the grandest scale that there is something deeply, cosmically wrong with regarding and treating fellow beings as mere units of any kind. This warning came so loud and clear that one would have thought it impossible to ignore. It came when, in the 20th century, a group of powerful and bloody-minded men in Germany hit on the idea of adapting the methods of the industrial stockyard as pioneered and perfected in Chicago to the slaughter, or what they preferred to call the processing, of human beings. Of course we cried out in horror when we found out what they had been up to. What a terrible crime to treat human beings like cattle, if we had only known beforehand But our cry should more accurately have been, what a terrible crime to treat human beings like units in an industrial process. And that cry should have had a postscript. What a terrible crime, come to think of it, a crime against nature to treat any living being like a unit in an industrial process. It would be a mistake to idealize traditional animal husbandry as the standard by which the animal products industry falls short. Traditional animal husbandry is brutal enough, just on a smaller scale. A better standard by which to judge both practices would be the simple standard of humanity. Is this truly the best that humans are capable of? 
the efforts of the animal rights movement, the broad movement that situates itself on the spectrum somewhere between the meliorism of the animal welfare bodies and the radicalism of animal liberation, are rightly directed at decent people who both know and don't know that there is something going on that stinks to high heaven. These are people who will say, yes, it's terrible what lives sows live. It's terrible what lives veal calves live but who will add, with a helpless shrug of the shoulders, what can I do about it? The task of the movement is to offer such people imaginative but practical options for what to do next after they have been revolted by a glimpse of the lives factory animals live and the deaths they die. People need to see that there are alternatives to supporting the animal products industry. These alternatives need not involve any sacrifice in health or nutrition, and there is no reason why these alternatives need be costly. Furthermore, what are commonly called sacrifices are not sacrifices at all. The only sacrifices in the whole picture, in fact, are being made by non-human animals. In this respect, children provide the brightest hope. Children have tender hearts. That is to say, children have hearts that have not been hardened by years of cruel and unnatural battering. Given half a chance, children see through the lies with which advertisers bombard them, the happy chicks that are transformed painlessly into succulent nuggets, the smiling moo cow that donates to us the bounty of her milk. It takes but one glance into a slaughterhouse to turn a child into a lifelong vegetarian. Factory farming is a new phenomenon, very new indeed in the history of animal husbandry. The good news is that after a couple of decades of what the businessmen behind it must have regarded as free and unlimited expansion, the industry has been forced onto the defensive. The activities of animal rights organizations have shifted the onus onto the industry to justify its practices, and because they are indefensible and unjustifiable, except on the most narrow economic grounds, do you want to pay $1.50 more for a dozen eggs? The industry is battening down hatches and hoping the storm will blow itself over. Insofar as there was a public relations war, the industry has already lost that war. A final note. The campaign of human beings for animal rights is curious in one respect. The creatures, on whose behalf human beings are acting, are unaware of what their benefactors are up to, and if they succeed, are unlikely to thank them. There is even a sense in which the animals do not know what is wrong. They do certainly not know what is wrong in the same way humans do. Thus, however close the well-meaning benefactor may feel to animals, the animal rights campaign remains a human project from beginning to end. For the animals, both human and non-human, this is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening.